Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the Holy Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Man dha alladhi yashfa'u indahu illa bi'idhni. Who can come forward with shafa'a, with intercession, except by the permission of the Almighty God? Sadaq Allahu al-Aliyu al-Azim. Illuminate your hearts and minds with a very loud salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. One of the very important discussions, not just in the religion of Islam, but across many religions, is the discussion of shafa'a, intercession. Many religions around the world believe in some form of intercession and shafa'a. In the, religious, in the religion of Islam, in Islamic theology, the topic, the belief in shafa'a is a very fundamental topic that Muslims believe in and it is well founded in the book of Allah, the Holy Quran. Now some people think that shafa'a is a theoretical discussion. It's something we discuss in the books. Does it have any impact on me? Does it influence my life? Or is this just a scholar? This is just a debate that the scholars have amongst themselves. One of the greatest influences in our lives is shafa'a. One of the greatest factors that determine your fate in this world and on the day of judgment is the degree of shafa'a intercession that you will be granted. It is extremely important for us to be aware of this topic of shafa'a, the dimensions of shafa'a, how to seek intercession as this has serious effects and impacts on our life and it will determine our fate on the day of judgment. As a result, we have dedicated a series of lectures and discussions to examine shafa'a. What exactly is shafa'a? Is it founded in the Holy Quran? What do various Muslim schools of thought say about shafa'a? What types of shafa'a do we have? Does the belief in shafa'a encourage people to sin? and say that I will get the shafa'a, the intercession. And so it doesn't really matter whether I have good deeds or bad deeds, I will get shafa'a. In this series, we will examine a number of fundamental points that revolve around the discussion of intercession and shafa'a. In our discussion tonight, we will begin by examining the meaning of shafa'a. What does it mean? What is the linguistic meaning of this word? Secondly, we will examine the types of shafa'a. How many types of intercession do we have? Then we will examine some verses in the Holy Quran that talk about shafa'a. There are some verses that negate shafa'a. How do we understand those verses? While there are other verses that confirm there is shafa'a. Is that a contradiction? How do we resolve this apparent contradiction? that some have claimed has occurred in the Holy Quran. And then finally, we will briefly examine what is the philosophy behind Shafa'a. Why has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted the power of Shafa'a to certain beings of His creation? Let us now begin by examining the meaning of Shafa'a. Shafa'a is intercession. It means that someone, a being that is more powerful than you, intercedes on your behalf, intervenes for you so that you get what you want. Shafa'a, very briefly, means a more powerful factor helping a less powerful factor so that the less powerful factor can achieve what it wants. To even put it in more simple terms, Shafa'a means to seek means. You want something to get done. So you need means. You need a way to get that thing done. You are seeking certain benefits. You want to arrive at those benefits. 
That's the meaning of shafa'a. Any means that allows you to get what you want, we call shafa'a. How many types of shafa'a do we have? What are the two fundamental types of shafa'a? We have the physical shafa'a and we have the metaphysical shafa'a. Let's examine the first type of shafa'a because it's a very important one and it sheds light on what shafa'a really is. And it helps us understand how the system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala works. The first type is called a shafa'a taqweeniya. The physical, natural shafa'a. What does that mean? If you examine the universe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created, you will find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a very delicate, concise system of causes and effects. The system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is such that there is no effect without a cause. Everything has a cause. This is the system of the Almighty God. There is a beautiful hadith in the book of Kafi by Al Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq alayhi salam in which he states, Allah and yujri al-ashya illa bi asbabin. It is the system of God that Everything that God does in the universe, all the affairs of the universe that God manages must have a cause. The universe in which we live in is a universe of cause and effect. Let me give you a very simple example. Let's say it's in January, it's bitterly cold and you want heat, you want warmth. You ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is your creator, who created you and He fulfills our needs for us. You ask Allah, oh Allah I want heat. How do you seek heat? Does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly instantaneously give you heat? No, He can if He wanted to but that's not His system. The system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that if you want heat, you have to seek certain means. You go get wood, Coal, fire, these are the natural means that generate heat. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to get heat, He'll make these causes available for you. He'll show you how to use these causes, these means. Now these means that generate heat for you all are called shafi'ah. Why? Because they are agents, means, to help you get what you want. That's one meaning of shafa'a. Shafa'a means you are too weak to generate heat yourself. You can't create fire yourself. You need something out there in the physical world to generate heat for you so you can survive, so you can have a warm house. Those means which you seek to generate that heat, now in the past it was wood or coal, today it's electricity or natural gas, these means are called shufa'a in the physical sense of the word because they are physical agents that help you get what you want. This is one meaning of shufa'a. And we have this shufa'a in the physical world because the system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is based on that. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the originator of everything. He has designed this system of causes and effects. The more you understand the causes, the greater you have access to the effects. And when you truly examine the universe, you see that there is only one system and that in itself points our intellect to the one God, that this universe has a designer. All these causes and effects, they're following one pattern. You know scientists, what do scientists do in trying to discover new laws? You know what scientists do? They look for patterns. That's exactly what they do. They observe the natural physical world around them. They identify certain patterns and then from these patterns they develop laws, theories and they make discoveries. That in itself is proof that there is no randomness in the universe. There's nothing random in this universe. Everything has a cause and effect. There is a delicate pattern. Scientists themselves, they know this. 
Their whole job is based on this fundamental fact that they look for patterns. Well, Habibi, if this universe was out of randomness, it came into existence without a creator, why are you looking for patterns? Why are you wasting your time? Everything should be random. There should be no system. The fact that there is a delicate system in itself proves that there is a creator who has one system of causes and effects. And you, the human being, you're trying to look for patterns in this system in order to make new discoveries, in order to say, seek new means, new natural physical means to get what you want. It's unbelievable that in this time and age, with all these scientific discoveries, yet there are those who reject the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They reject the idea that there is an intelligent designer. Look at the delicate system in this world, brothers and sisters. Just look at our planet. Just look at the gases around us. This atmosphere. You know, our atmosphere extends 500 miles into the sky. This atmosphere is a combination of gases that allow you to live. If it weren't for these gases, there would be no life on earth. These gases protect us from harmful sun rays. They provide us a magnetic field. They protect the earth from asteroids and meteors crashing into earth. All of this from thin air. Oh no, that's random. That's what they tell you. Look at the oxygen that we breathe. By the way, the most gas that we have on earth is not oxygen. It's nitrogen. 78% of the air around you is nitrogen. 21% is oxygen. And then you have a trace of other gases. Now our bloodstream can absorb oxygen, but we cannot absorb nitrogen. Now why this balance? Ask a scientist why. Why 78% nitrogen and 21% oxygen? Why is it not the other way around? You know what would have happened if it was the other way around? If you had 78% oxygen, the entire earth would be flammable. You would start a fire somewhere and every other thing around you would get burned. Because fire increases rapidly with oxygen. This is a delicate balance. If you had less oxygen, many creatures could not survive. We need oxygen. If you had more oxygen, we would die. This world would be too poisonous for us. Why is it that we have these specific elements? That in itself tells you there is an intelligent designer. Even when you look at the creation of the universe, those few minutes after the Big Bang, do you know how precise they were, brothers and sisters? Stephen Hawking, he himself says, if the rate of the expansion of the universe, seconds after the Big Bang, was smaller than one in a hundred thousand million million, the universe could not expand into its present size. It would have recollapsed. Question, who determined that rate? Where did it come from? Oh, random, out of nowhere. Do you understand how irresponsible atheism is to reject the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Now if you want to know how small this chance is, Roger Penrose, who is a professor of math and physics at Oxford, he gives us an example to see how small this chance is that the universe just came into existence. If you look at the laws of probability, it's impossible of course, but he's trying to put a number to it. Listen to his example. He says if the entire universe is a canvas, you know those people who play darts? You have a canvas, you take the dart and you shoot it. If the entire universe was a big canvas and you take a dart and you randomly shoot it at that canvas. Now every point on which this dart lands will generate a different universe or no universe at all. Do you know what are the chances of this dart landing on a point in this canvas which is as big as the universe that will result in the creation of this current universe that we have? 
You take a dart and you're just randomly throwing it. What are the chances of that dart landing in the right spot to create this universe? Do you know how small these chances are? He says this chance is smaller than one in 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 123. Do you want to know how small that is? He says, if you were to put a zero, if you want to write this number, 0 0.00000, how many zeros do you have to put? He says, if you were to put a zero next to every atom in the universe, how many atoms are there in your bodies? Seven trillion. This one body has on average seven trillion atoms. Now imagine the entire universe. If you were to put a zero next to every atom in the universe, you couldn't write this number. That's how small it is. Yet they tell you, no, it's possible, it's possible. And then they give you the example of a lottery. Yeah, the chance is small, but you could still win the lottery. And every once in a while, somebody is winning the lottery. Habibi, the lottery was developed by intelligent beings. Did the lottery itself also create itself? and generate out of nowhere? Yes, when you have a functional system, you could have laws of probability. The lottery was designed by intelligent beings. They know what they're doing. You can't compare the creation of the universe to a lottery, that's nonsense. Subhanallah, once an Imam al-Sadiq was having a debate with a leading atheist during his time. His name was Abu Shakir al-Daysani. Abu Shakir, after having a number of debates with Imam al-Sadiq he tells him, Dullani ala ma'budi. Show me, where is God? There was a young boy playing with an egg by Imam al-Sadiq The Imam al looks around, he sees the egg in the hands of this boy. He tells him, give it to me. The Imam al holds the egg and he shows it to Abu Shakir al-Daysani. Then listen to the beautiful hadith of the Imam. In, in Arabic, the eloquence of it is amazing. The Imam السلام, tells Abu Shakir, see, it is such a strong fort that has no doors. It's a strong fort. And the Imam السلام, when he says strong, he really means strong. You know this shell of the egg, how strong it is? You think it's fragile, we easily break it. But do you know how much weight it can withstand? Try it, take an egg and try to compress it from the top and bottom of it. Apply equal pressure, it's very difficult to break it. You probably can't, most of you cannot. If you apply equal pressure to the shell, it can withstand. In fact, in the lab, they tried to compress the egg. You know how much weight an egg can handle? If you put it vertically and you compress it, you put weight on it, it can handle 50 pounds of weight. And if you put it horizontally, it can handle 90 pounds of weight. 90 pounds, that's about 40 kilograms. SubhanAllah, and the Imam السلام, says, it's a strong fort. Then listen to what the Imam السلام, says. He says, on its outside is a hard skin, and below it is a thin membrane. You know that white stuff? Then the Imam says, inside which? flow two seas of gold and silver. But neither can the yellow mix with the white, nor the white can merge with the yellow. Neither can a repairer enter it, nor a destroyer comes out of it. Then the Imam السلام, continues to say, no one can even know whether this newborn child in it, this newborn would be a male or female. Then all of a sudden it cracks, and you see a beautiful chick emerge out of it. The Imam السلام, tells him, don't you think this egg has a creator? Allahu Akbar. When the Imam السلام, tells Abu Shakir al-Daysani, a leading atheist, he gives him this example, he falls into sujood, and he says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. I bear witness that there's no God but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How can we reject all these signs? Now going back to our discussion of shafa'a, the first type of shafa'a simply means that God has developed a system in this universe of causes and effects. 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the one who has determined these causes and effects. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who has designated the system. So anytime that you seek natural means, that's shafa'ah. Question, is there any proof in the Holy Quran to what I'm saying? That we have this type of shafa'ah? Yes. Listen to the Holy Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in Surah Yunus, verse 3, Allah says, "Inna Rabbakum Allahu alladhi khalaq as-samawati wal-arda fi sittati ayyam." Indeed, your Lord is Allah Subhanahu wa Taala who created the heavens and the earth in six days, meaning six stages. ثم استوى على العرش يدبر يدبر الأمر. Then Allah Subhanahu wa Taala assumed power over the throne to manage the affairs of the universe. Question: When Allah is now examining the universe for us and he's telling us about the creation of the universe and that Allah manages the affairs. Is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talking about this physical universe or he's talking about religious laws and forgiveness? Which is it? Of, all, of course Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about this physical universe because he's saying I created the universe in six stages. يُدَبِّرُ amr. I have power over the throne, I am managing the affairs of the universe. So is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talking about tashri' legislation, or He's talking about taqween, the creation of the universe. Allah is talking about taqween, the genesis and the creation of the universe. Then listen to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. مَا مِن شَفِيعٍ إِلَّا مِن بَعْدِ إِذْنِهِ There is no shafi' nothing can intercede, Accept with this permission. Question, what does shafa'ah have to do with the creation of the universe? Which type of shafa'ah is Allah talking about here? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse, according to scholars and our understanding of the Qur'an, He's talking about this first type of shafa'ah. We're not talking about the you know, prophet on the day of judgment interceding on our behalf. No, that's another type of shafa'ah. We're talking about physical shafa'ah. That means Allah is saying, look you human being. I created the universe, I am the one who decided the causes and the effects. I developed the system. Nothing in the universe can give you an effect without my permission. Everything is within the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is one meaning of shafa'ah. I'll give you another example. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah An-Nahl verse 69. He states, ثُمَّ كُلِي مِنْ كُلِّ الثَّمَرَاتِ فَاسْلُكِي سُبُلَ رَبِّكِ ذُلَلًا يَخْرُجُ مِنْ بُطُونِهَا شَرَابٌ مُخْتَلِفٌ أَلْوَانُهُ فِيهِ شِفَاءٌ لِلنَّاسِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the honeybee. Allah says, I have guided the honeybee to go to different fruits and flowers, to, to, to eat from those fruits and flowers, and then what happens? From its stomach, it generates for you, it produces for you a drink that is multicolored. Have you seen the types of honey? They come in many different colors. What does that honey do? As the Quran states, Fihi shifa'un linnas. It has the power of healing for people. Wait a minute, isn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the healer? Isn't He the ultimate healer? How is Allah saying in the Holy Quran that the asal, the honey, has the power to heal you? See, honey is a shafi'ah. It's a natural physical agent. When you are sick, you take the medicine from it and you get healed. Same with medicine, any other type of medicine. We call this Shafa'ata queeniya. Now who is the one who put the power of healing in honey? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're still within his system. The honey is not independently healing you. Allah is the ultimate healer. As Ibrahim alayhi salam states in the Holy Quran. When I get sick, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala heals me. But how? Does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just directly give you healing? Or no, there's a process. There's a process. And one of them is honey medicine, anything out there in the world that has healing, it has healing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we see that the Holy Quran does talk about natural means. And these natural means 
are shufa'a fi alam at taqween in this physical world. No one can deny this. This is from the Holy Quran. Now, this is one type of shafa'a. We have another type of shafa'a. Just as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed certain powers in natural means, natural agents in this world to help you, then in the religious field, on the day of judgment, in this world, to help you reach guidance, to help you have your sins forgiven, Allah has also given you shufa'a. Allah has also given you agents of intercession that if you seek them, Allah forgives you your sins. So for example, they are the angels, the prophets, righteous servants of Allah, even the Holy Quran. We'll talk about the shufa'a in another night as we continue our series. Just as Allah in the physical world has given you means to achieve something, and we call this shafa'a according to the Quran, even in the religious realm, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has assigned shufa'a. Now there are many Muslims today from other schools of thought who will come back and tell you what? No. What are you talking about with this shafa'a? You know, interestingly, even though shafa'a is well founded in the Quran, today many, many Muslims, they believe shafa'a is a Shia innovation. The minute you hear shafa'a, oh, these Rafili Shias, they invented it, they came up with this idea, and it's a form of shirk. And they accuse us of blasphemy, of heresy, because we believe in shafa'a when it's well founded in the Holy Quran. Now some of these Muslims will come back and tell you, wait a minute, but the Qur'an negates that there is shafa'a. We have clear verses in the Holy Qur'an that say there is no shafa'a. And how many times have you been to Masjid al-Haram? And that speaker is screaming in the microphone. And he is blasting Muslims for believing in shafa'a. And they read to you these verses. See, Allah Himself, He's, see, he's saying there is no shafa'a. How do we understand these verses? How do we respond to these verses? It's very important for us to examine these verses. We have three types of verses in the Holy Quran when it comes to the issue of shafa'a. Ah. The first type of verses are those verses which negate shafa'a. Ah. They clearly state there is no shafa'a, ah, there is no intercession. What are those verses? For example, you have in the Holy Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah verse 48. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, وَاتَّقُوا يَوْمًا لَا تَجْزِي نَفْسٌ عَنْ نَفْسٍ شَيْئًا Fear that day, the day of judgment. On that day, nobody can help anyone. No one can avail anyone. وَلَا يُقْبَلُ مِنْهَا شَفَاعَةٌ And no shafa'a shall be accept accepted on the day of judgment. So see, here we have a verse in the Holy Quran in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is clearly rejecting shafa'a. So you see, these Shias who believe in shafa'a, they're violating the Quran. That's their argument. We have to understand the book of Allah. Allah says, think, contemplate. Don't just memorize verses like a parrot not knowing what they mean. This verse in the Holy Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah, who is it addressing? In these verses, Allah is talking to Bani Israel. In the previous verse, Allah says, Ya Bani Israel. Allah is talking to the Jewish nation from Bani Israel. The Bani Israel, they had a belief that because we are the descendants of prophets, we're the chosen nation, we're the chosen people, we're the favorite people to God. Then regardless of what we do, whether we believe or not, whether we sin or not, we're saved. That was their belief, even until today, by the way. They have similar beliefs. In another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala captures their words when they said, وَقَالُوا لَن تَمَسَّنَ النَّارُ إِلَّا أَيَّامًا معدودة. And they claimed that, okay, even if we have a lot of sins and we violate God and we don't believe, we'll go to hell just a few days. قُلْ أَتَّخَدْتُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَحْدًا when, when did Allah make this agreement with you? That you'll go to hell only a few days and then you'll be saved. See? Their understanding was that just because I am Jewish, just because I am from Bani Israel, from this tribe, from that tribe, I'm saved. The Quran is rejecting this type of shafa'a. The Quran is saying, no, 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 no. On the day of judgment, Allah will not see 
Whose son are you? Whose grandson are you? From which tribe you came? No, on the day of judgment, there is no shafa'a that will help you in this sense. Just because you're from Bani Israel, then you're saved. Allah is rejecting this notion of shafa'a. Not, Allah is not rejecting all types of shafa'a. Once Tawus al-Yamani, he says, I went to Masjid al-Haram in the midst of the night. And I saw a man holding the curtain of the Kaaba. And he was weeping and crying, addressing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I came close to him to hear what he would be saying. Ilahi gharat nujumu samawatik. Oh Allah, now your stars are visible in the midst of the night. And people, people are sleeping. وَهَجَعَتْ عُيُونُ عِبَادِكَ وَبَابُكَ مَفْتُوحَةٌ لِلطَّالِبِينَ Oh Allah, people are sleeping. But your doors are open to those who ask. Then he makes a request from Allah. Oh Allah, أَرَنِي وَجْهَ مُحَمَّدٍ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ فِي عَرَصَاتِ الْقِيَامَةِ Oh Allah, forgive me and show me the face of Muhammad in the difficulties of the Day of Judgment. And he started to cry and cry. Tawus al-Yamani, he says, I came to him. I saw this is Ali ibn al Hussein, al-Imam Zayn al-Abideen. I told him, Sayyidi, you are saying this, we should say this. You're crying when you are the grandson of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Why all these tears? You know what the Imam alayhi salam tells him? Don't talk about my grandfathers and who my family is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, first he tells him about paradise. He says, Allah has created heaven for the one who obeys him, even if he's an Abyssinian slave. An African slave, because the Arabs, they would view them negatively. The Imam says, if an Abyssinian slave obeys Allah, he'll go to paradise. وَخَلَقَ الْنَارَ لِمَنْ عَصَاهُ وَإِنْ كَانَ سَيِّدًا قُرَشِيًّا And Allah has created hellfire for the one who disobeys him, even if he's a very well-known person from Quraysh. You see the logic of the religion of Islam? Just because your father is so-and-so, your mother is so and so, you come from this tribe, it doesn't mean that you will be saved. But this was the common idea that the Jews had at the time and they still have this until today. So the Quran in rejecting the shafa'a, it is rejecting this type of shafa'a. That in the end you have to believe, you have to have good deeds. You can't just say I'm from this tribe, I'm saved. Then we have other types of verses in the Holy Quran that negate the shafa'a and those verses are aimed at who? They are aimed at the pagans. What did the pagans state? We have to understand what the pagan philosophy was in order to understand this. Because we have a number of verses in the Holy Quran that condemn the pagans and they negate shafa'a. The pagans at the time of the Prophet the idol worshippers, you know what their belief was? They believed that God is the one who can benefit or harm us. They did believe in God. But they believed that in order for God to give me any blessings or to protect me from any harm, I have to go and seek the shafa'a, the intercession of an idol. And in order for me to convince the idol to do shafa'a for me, I have to worship the idol. I have to sacrifice things for the idol. And that's what they would do. They would sacrifice sheep and camels for their idols. Once I worship the idol and I do my ibadah for the idol, then the idol will intercede on my behalf. So God blesses us, He sends the rain, He gives me, he gives me kids, so on and so forth. This was their flawed understanding that in this life, by the way, their shafa'a had nothing to do with the hereafter. They didn't believe that these idols will help them in the hereafter. Why? Because they didn't even believe in the day of judgment. They would say that when we die, that's it. We become dust and we're, we're over. 
So they believe that in this physical life, if you want God to help you, you have to worship an idol. So the Quran came to reject that. The Quran came to say no, there is no such thing. There is absolutely no such thing. Allah has never given permission to these idols. They have no role in you being blessed by God and receiving your rizq and sustenance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these verses that reject the shafa'a, they are rejecting these two types of shafa'a. That which the Jews believed in, you're saved if you're from this tribe. The Quran says no, that's not going to help you just if you, just because you're from this tribe. And the second one is worshipping idols in hopes that they benefit you by interceding on your behalf. This is what the Holy Quran negates. That's one type of verses that we have in the Holy Quran. Then we have a second type of verses in the Quran that clearly state there is shafa'a. Verse 255, many of you have memorized it. Ayatul Kursi. In Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, مَنْ ذَا الَّذِي يَشْفَعُ عِنْدَهُ Who can do shafa'a? إِلَّا بِإِذْنِهِ Except with the permission of God. That means with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is intercession. There is shafa'a. These are the clear words of the Holy Quran. I'll share with you a number of other verses. Surah Taha verse 109. يَوْمَئِذٍ لَا تَنْفَعُ الشَّفَاعَةُ إِلَّا مَنْ أَذِنَ لَهُ الرَّحْمَانُ وَرَضِيَ قَوْلَ On the day of judgment, no shafa'a can help you except the shafa'a that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives permission to and He's pleased with. So that means there is shafa'a that will help you. However, with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then in Surah Al-Anbiya verses 26 to 28, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, وَقَالُوا اتَّخَذَ الرَّحْمَانُ وَلَدَا سُبْحَانَهُ بَلْ عِبَادٌ مُكْرَمُونَ The pagans said that God has daughters. Who are His daughters? The angels. That was their belief. That, that's what the pagans stated. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rejects this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, No, بَلْ عِبَادٌ مُكْرَمُونَ They are the servants, slaves of God. لَا يَسْبِقُونَهُ بِالْقَوْلِ وَهُمْ بِأَمْرِهِ يَعْمَلُونَ they obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they do not disobey Allah. Then Allah states, يَعْلَمُ مَا بَيْنَ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَمَا خَلْفَهُمْ وَلَا يَشْفَعُونَ إِلَّا لِمَنْ ارْتَضَى Allah is talking about the angels. He is aware of them and they cannot do shafa'a except for the one whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives permission to. Except by the rida, satisfaction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in this verse, Allah is saying the angels, they can do shafa'a. In another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Najm, verse 26, Allah states, وَكَمْ مِنْ مَلَكٍ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ لَا تُغْنِي شَفَاعَتُهُمْ شَيْئًا إِلَّا مِنْ بَعْدِ أَنْ يَأْذَنَ اللَّهِ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيَرْضَى Allah says, how many angels are there in the universe? They can only do shafa'a by the permission of God. Brothers and sisters, when the Quran says this, does that mean is there shafa'a or no? Of course there is shafa'a. However, with one condition, by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a second type of verses that we have. Then we have a third type of verses. Those verses say only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has shafa'a. And some Muslims will use these verses. See, only God can forgive you. He has the power to intercede on your behalf and forgive you. No one else can. Yes, we do have in Surah Al-Zumar, Verse 44, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, قُلْ لِلَّهِ الشَّفَاعَةُ جَمِيعًا Say Allah has all the intercession. But we have to be familiar with the language of the Qur'an. The Qur'an gives us three types of verses. One says Allah has all the shafa'a. One says there is no shafa'a. One says there is shafa'a by His permission. What does that mean? That means there is shafa'a, but Allah is the one who can only grant shafa'a. No one in the universe has the power to do shafa'a except by the permission of God. That's what it means. And by the way, this language is very common in the Quran. I'll give you some very quick examples. When it comes, for instance, to the taking of our souls, who takes your soul? What does the Quran say? There are three verses. One verse says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who takes your soul 
when you die. So this verse says, Allah takes your soul. Another verse says what? قُلْ يَتَوَفَّاكُمْ مَلَكُ الْمَوْتِ الَّذِي وُكِلَ بِكُمْ A second verse says, the angel of death is the one who takes your soul. Then there's a thir third verse that states, تَوَفَّتْهُمْ رُسُلُنَا Allah is talking about certain people dying. Allah says, my messengers, meaning my angels, they take their souls. Which is it? Is it Allah? Is it the angel of death? Is it the other angels? Who's taking our soul? Ultimately, it is God who decides when you die. Ultimately, He takes the soul. However, Allah does so not directly. Allah does so through means. He has agents working for Him. And who is the biggest agent who takes our souls? Azrael, the angel of death. But even Azrael, he himself has aids working for him. It appears from some ahadith that the angel of death, he doesn't take the life of everyone, the soul of everyone. He only goes to those who are very high in iman and those who are very evil. These two, the angel of death, he goes after them. As for a lot of people, he sends angels to do that on his behalf. As for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whose soul does he take? There is one hadith that states the shuhada of Karbala. Allah did not give permission to even the angel of death to take their souls. Allah says, I will take their souls directly to honor them. Sometimes when a king really wants to honor you, he doesn't send his aid to do something for you, right? He himself does it. That's the honor that Allah gives to, to the shuhada. Now is this a contradiction in the Qur'an? No. Allah takes the soul, but through agents. The same with everything. Allah says, يُدَبِّرُ الْأَمْرُ I manage the affairs of the universe. However, in Surah Al-Naza'at, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? فَالْمُدَبِّرَاتِ amra. Allah is talking about the angels in Surah Al-Naza'at who manage the affairs of the universe. Allah says, they manage the affairs of the universe. So wait a minute. Who's managing? Is it Allah or the angels? Allah manages through the angels. That's shafa'a. That is the meaning of shafa'a. Allah has authorized them to manage the affairs of the universe. And we have many examples in the Holy Quran. This is not a contradiction and this is how we understand the verses of the Quran. So yes, ultimately Allah can forgive. But through means. Well, in the upcoming nights we will talk about these means. How do I achieve salvation on the day of judgment. How do I have my sins forgiven? That's very important, my dear brothers and sisters. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ultimately has the power of shafa. Ah. Yes, but He has means. Just like in the natural physical world, Allah has means for you to get something done. Also in the religious world, also when it comes to forgiveness, because Allah he is the designer of both systems, the physical system and the religious system. They have the same standards. Many Muslims unfortunately don't understand this. Now two final quick points about shafa'a. Ah. Some may wonder, but why does Allah empower certain individuals or beings to have shafa'a? Ah? Why? Even the angels, why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Give them the task of running the affairs of the universe. Aside from showing His power and glory that Allah is the king and He has all these aids working for Him, aside from that, Allah wants to honor the angels. Angels are pure creations of God. They obey God. Allah wants to reward them. You know how He rewards them? He gives them these important tasks. Jibra'il is, is the greatest angel of God. Allah assigned him to be the trustee of wahi. Amin al-wahi to carry the revelation of God. That's an honor that Allah gives Jibra'il. Allah doesn't need to, but that's an honor. Same with the prophets and the Ahlul Bayt. Imam al Hussein gave everything for Allah on the day of Ashura. The Holy Prophet gave everything he had for the sake of Islam. How is God going to reward him? You tell me. Paradise? He didn't do it for paradise. Give him money, power, he didn't do it for money, power. What can you give Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and the prophets and the imams of Ahlul Bayt such that you do justice to what they did? You know how Allah rewards them? By granting them the position of shafa'a. Ah. Allah is telling his entire creation, you want to come to me, you go through them. They are my gates. 
I ask you, brothers and sisters, is there an honor greater than this? Is there? When the king of the universe is saying, you want to come to me? Go through Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Salawatullahi alayhim. Those Muslims who reject Shafa'a, they reject the justice of God. They reduce the prophets and the imams to beings who just did what they did for paradise. That's not what they were. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honors them through shafa'ah. This is one fundamental reason why we have shafa'ah. In the upcoming nights, we'll explore other reasons why we have shafa'ah. Final point here, my dear brothers and sisters, about shafa'ah. There are many Muslims, this is a very common argument that you will find, who will come and tell you, look, God is my creator, I worship him, I don't need anybody else. You can just talk to God, worship God, and supplicate to God. Why bring the name of anyone, the prophet or the imams? I have Allah and I could worship him directly. How many times have you heard that? These Muslims who make this argument, aside from misunderstanding the Quran, they're missing a fundamental point. I say to those dear Muslims who have this mentality, I don't need anyone. I can just talk to God and worship Him without needing to go through any gate. That's their argument. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided to talk to you and to send you words and guidance, did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do it directly? Or was it through a means and a medium? Didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala choose the prophets? Didn't he choose Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa to talk to you? If God, the king of the universe, chose Muhammad to talk to you, you have to go through the same Muhammad to talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Couldn't God talk to you directly? Couldn't? Does Allah... Does, it, does he have not have the power to talk to us directly and reveal verses in our hearts and show us what to do? Why didn't he do it? Why did Allah choose a medium, which is Muhammad wa al Muhammad? Why did he choose them? To teach you the human being. Just like I sent you guidance through them, you want to worship me? You have to go through their door. The worship is to Allah. The ibadah is solely for Allah. But you have to go through them. And many misunderstand this. You know, those people who say, why can't God communicate directly to me? Why can't I worship Him directly? They're very arrogant. Who says you're qualified for Allah to talk to you directly? Allah talks to the prophets. Even them He sends Jibra'il. You have to be qualified to receive direct guidance from God. It's arrogant to say, no, I'll talk to God directly without going through a gate. No, who gave you that right? Allah has assigned these gates for you to go through. In the upcoming nights, we'll examine shafa'ah and the dimensions of shafa'ah and who has the power to intercede on our behalf. Prophet Yusuf السلام, was in prison for seven years. One hadith states, or it also appears from the Quran, that one reason why he stayed there for long is that he asked one of those who left the prison to tell the king to help him, to save him. He, that wasn't a sin. It's okay for him to do that. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has higher standards from the Prophet. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to discipline him. You know what was the dua that Yusuf made that got him out of prison? Al Imam al Sadiq salam tells us in one hadith he fell into sujood, he put his head on the ground, he put his cheek on the ground, and he says, Ilahi in kanat dhunubi qad akhlaqat wajhi andak. Oh Allah, if my sins, he had no sins, but he's saying this out of humbleness. If my sins have darkened my face with you, فَإِنِّي أَتَوَسَّلُ إِلَيْكَ بِوَجْهِ آبَائِيَ إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَإِسْمَاعِيلَ وَإِسْحَاقَ وَيَعْقُوبَ Oh Allah, then I turn to you by the face of my grandfathers, Ibrahim, Ismail, Ishaq, and Ya'qub. Allah granted him his relief and Allah released him from the prison. The companion of Imam al-Sadiq asks Imam al-Sadiq, should we make the same dua? Imam al-Sadiq tells him, make this dua. Say, Ilahi in kanat qad akhlaqat dhunubi, akhlaqat dhunubi wajhi andak. 
فإني أتوجه إليك بنبي الرحمة محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وأهل بيته الطاهرين O oh Allah, if my sins have darkened my face with you in your eyes, then I turn to you to Nabi al-Rahmah, the Prophet of Mercy, Muhammad and the Ahl al-Bayt, salawatullahi alayhim ajma'een. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open our hearts for guidance and to grant us the intercession of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi and the Imams of Ahl al-Bayt wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa alihi al-Tayyibin al-Tahirin.